Uh, obviously, we're not going to finish this up until uh, March because we have uh, not only to finish up this portion of God's Word, but we have must finish up uh, the coming of the Lord. And uh, this week, I uh, last week I said that we would get into the family of God. Now, for some of you, this will not be anything new. But for many of you, uh, this is going to be something new and something perhaps that you haven't heard. And so, uh, you're going to have to get set for it. When you get to heaven, uh, where was that? In uh, We just read this thing here in Revelation chapter 19. Uh, where we read uh, about uh, verse 5. Look at there in verse 5, Revelation chapter 19. It says something there that uh, most of us as God's people, we read the Bible, read it over and don't see the words. But he says that a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Both small and great. Now it becomes very apparent from the word of God here, that not everybody's equal in heaven. There's small and there's great there. And uh, we'll read that, but we don't pay any attention to it. It's just like as if, well, God put it in there because he didn't have anything else to do. But it becomes very apparent, my dear friends, that there are some people who hold high positions, some people who hold low positions, and that there is a family of God in heaven, and that there are different offices and different positions in heaven. Uh, for too long, we have had the philosophy, we've had the preaching of uh, get saved and go to heaven and everything is peaches and cream. And that is not true, never was true, and never will be true. If that were true, then, my dear friend, the greatest farce in all the world is for God to save you and then let you stay on this earth. That would be the greatest farce. You say, well, we're supposed to witness to other people. Yeah, but God could save them. He don't need you and me. He's got you and I here for a reason. He's got you and I here for a number of reasons. But one of the most important reasons is that He's getting us ready to live with a family of people. Well, there'll be different positions within the household of God. We've been studying here in the book of uh, Revelation. and We've gone through the tribulation four times. Now we come to this portion of God's Word which makes it clear and plain that there's something going on. Something that God has been looking for, the Father's been looking for for a long time. And there isn't a child of God or all of God's children put together that are as anxious for God, uh, for anxious for the Lord Jesus to come as God the Father is. I can remember when my daughter was going to get married and my son were going to get married and even though I didn't have a lot to do with it, but yet there was great anticipation that my son was going to get a bride. There was great anticipation. A lot of excitement. A lot of preparation. I couldn't wait for that day. I really couldn't. Of course, Mommy, she didn't want to see her babies go, but then that's part of the game. But there was great anticipation for me that the bride, that my son was going to get a bride. Now, I'm going to use that, just that illustration because it illustrates what we're talking about here. And the closer the time came, the, and, and, and the closer it came to that time, the more excited I got, the more I was looking forward to it. I want you to know something right here now that God the Father, and the closer it gets time for His Son to get His bride, is excited. Now, we don't understand this thing. We don't pay any attention to it. And yet all the way through the Bible, He's talking about the bride and the bridegroom, the church uh, and, and the head of the church. And he's talking constantly. And uh, even as Christ loved the church, so uh, he tell, tells husbands and wives, he gives us a picture. And there's a great emphasis upon the fact that there is a wedding coming. And that there is a wedding supper coming. Great emphasis. Those who speak on it mutilate it. Many of them. I'm not going to say that we are Bible giants, but I'm going to say we're going to take Bibles... God's Word for it as it is. Let's get to understand something from the Word of God here and we'll get into it in detail here. There is the bride and there is the bridegroom and there is the father and there are friends of the bridegroom and there are virgins. V-I-R 
G-I-N-S, plural. There are concubines in the household of God. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Song of Solomon, chapter 3. Song of Solomon, chapter 6. Don't worry about getting those down. We'll go into those in detail. Psalm 45 describes very clearly and very plainly this household of God. The great tragedy today is people don't understand it simply because they just will not read the English. And so we're going to be English reading people this morning. All right. Revelation chapter 19 verse 1 gets us into heaven. And we spent two weeks, about two weeks on verse 1. Uh, which is uh, uh, an important verse. And by now I think that you understand, and I hope you understand, that you know how to pray. I spoke to your young people yesterday morning. It was it yesterday morning or this morning? Out of Second uh, Thessalonians, or First Thessalonians, one of the two. And showed them what is the glory of God. What is? Uh, I want... You know, we've got God's people, and, and we wonder why we're, so, pardon the expression, and I'm going to use the vernacular street, why we're so screwed up. We pray and we say, uh, God, get glory out of my life. Oh, Christ, get glory out of my life. Well, have you ever stopped to consider, how does Christ get glory out of your life? Well, I, uh, and so I asked your young people that, and my, they gave me all kinds of answers, beautiful answers. But I said, I don't want to hear those answers. I want to hear what the Word of God says, how you get Christ gets glory out of your life. And when I gave it to them, it looked like I had gone to a funeral. Everybody looked at me and said, uh-uh, that's not for me. But you know how you bring glory to Christ? Suffer. S-U-F-F-E-R. Suffer. First Peter chapter 2. And if you suffer for your own fault, and let me tell you something right here now. A lot of God's people are going through some suffering today. <laughs> I'm going to try to keep my message. I, I've got to preach Sunday night, and I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to separate the two things so I don't get them all things. But there's a lot of suffering going on today, and I want to tell you something. Peter is uh, turning with me to it. <laughs> we'll get to Revelation chapter 19. I've got to get this off my chest, okay? Um, I've got a couple of hairs growing out. I don't want to have any more on my chest, and... I want them to continue. First Peter chapter 2, you know this by heart. And we're going to go ahead then back, back to it. But look at verse 19. First uh, Peter chapter 2. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, endure grief, suffering wrongfully. That's thankworthy. Anything else isn't thankworthy. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? What glory. Now, this is not new stuff to you. But we need to realize the fresh and the new. He says, you got yourself into a mess and you're suffering for it. Uh, uh, and you take it as patiently as you can. Let me just tell you something right here now. It doesn't bring a thing for God as far as God is concerned. Now watch that thing. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. And so on and so forth. It goes on down. You want to bring glory to Christ? Learn to suffer for him. We had a lady in our church uh, one time, and uh, I'm not going to call any names out, but she uh, years ago she said that, my trouble is I don't have patience. And she said, I'm praying that God will give me patience. <laughs> and I says, uh, well, uh, how do you think God's going to give you patience? Well, I don't know, but I'm just praying for God to give you patience. I said, well, now that's the stupidest thing in the whole wide world. And she looked at me and I says, you may pray for God to give you patience, and, and God will give you patience, but because you don't know what you're looking for, you may not know that you got it. You ever think about that? You may think that you, uh, you may be looking for it and, uh, and you get it and then you don't know you got it. I said that uh, Romans tells us that the only way you get patience is through what? Tribulation. <gasps> well, I'm saved. 
I believe in the premillennial return of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I believe in the tribulation. I believe in tithing. That don't make a difference. The only way you get patience is through tribulation. Uh, and the great tragedy today is this, the reason God's people don't have patience is when they ask for it, God puts them through something to, to teach them patience, and then they grumble and complain and they bellyache. Pardon the expression. But that's what they do. They grumble and they complain. So now in Revelation chapter 19, if you're going to bring glory to God, you're going to have to suffer. <clears throat> God says there's no, there's nothing thankworthy in anything that you do unless you're going to suffer for it. There's suffering. The Lord Jesus Christ brought glory to God the Father. How? Through suffering. This world is not a friend of Jesus Christ. And if it's not, and if it's a friend of yours, got a problem somewhere. This world thinks well of you, my friend, then you got a problem. And I've got a problem. Because this world doesn't think much of your Christ. Much less God. This world doesn't think much of, of the church today. And I can't blame them for seeing all the idiots that we've had on television. I, we're living in a day and age, and I, and I mean it seriously, dear people. We're living in a day and age where people want their ears tickled. They don't want Bible doctrine. Preacher said, he said, well, he said, if you want to get, now we can lead people to Christ, but if you want to learn to get your, to, to know your Bible, you go to Bible Baptist Church. Well, now, he was throwing that as a slam, but that's a compliment. And let me tell you very frankly, my dear friend, there are just not too many people that want to live for Christ and walk for Christ. There's too many people that are opinionated today about what God can do or what God can't do without knowing what God said He can do. And so this goes on up there in heaven in chapter 1, verses 1 through. Now we're closing, we're closing out the tribulation, but this is going on in heaven. This will now take you back to Revelation chapter 4 and part of Revelation chapter 5. The judgment seat of Christ, of which everybody knows how to spell, but nobody knows anything, not too many people know anything about it. You say, well, now, preacher, you, you can't include me in that. I can include you in that if you're not living like there's a judgment seat of Christ coming. I'm going to speak to you young people, but God is dead. Sunday morning, I made up my mind. God's people living today like God is dead. Uh, Brother Mike, will you turn that, it's warm here now, isn't it? Can you turn that thermostat on? It gets warm in here very quickly. Either that or it's just me. I don't know which. All right, look at verse 5 now. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And His wife hath made herself ready. Are you ready? Ma says it made herself ready. What do you think this is? It's all a little barn paint on a, what is it, a Mary Kay or, or Avon and smear yourself up a little bit and stand before him and say, here I am, Lord. And boy, he turns that hose on you and, and all that garbage is washed off and it shows you the real you. I mean, that's what it says. That's what it says. She has made herself ready. Now, we spent a lot of time in talking about that, so I'm not going to go back uh, into that again. And it says, and to her. Now, who's the, what's the antecedent of the word her? The wife. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saint, of saints. And he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Bride is never invited to a wedding. Bride is part of the wedding. And here again you have that study in God's Word about the fact that there is a marriage. And then there is a marriage supper. And there's a difference in the time element there, my dear friend. Because they're not in the first place, they're not in the same verse. And the second place, 
there's something that happens to get that bride ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, as I said last week, these are the symbolic, apocalyptic, and interpretive sayings of God. No, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and thy brethren that have testimony, that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now the first thing I want to say as we start this study tonight, and I, I want to fin- I really do want to finish this up and so we can deal with the coming of the Lord, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus uh, next uh, week, the Lord willing, and I want to study that and at least get part of that done uh, so we, by the middle of uh, uh, March, we can be uh, going into Revelation chapter 20, which is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. But this is preparing you for the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. My dear people, I want you to know that the Bible clearly and plainly states that there is a marriage. First thing the Bible states is that there is an engagement. Amen? How many do not know that? I have a spouse you to one wife. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. I have a spouse you to one wife that I might present you as a chaste virgin. You know what a chaste virgin is? And we're a mixed crowd here, uh, but there's no young people here. I think I can speak. A chaste virgin is a chaste virgin. It's one who has never known another man. It's one who has never been intimate with any other man. The Bible speaks of spiritual fornication. The Bible speaks of committing spiritual adultery. Uh, simply and clearly and plainly, and I'm not going to get into that tonight, although we probably need to get into it one of these days again on marriage and divorce. My dear friend, according to the Bible, a divorce is a separation of flesh. A divorce has nothing to do with going to a court someplace and have a judge hand you a piece of paper. That's rendering under Caesar. As far as God is concerned, a marriage is when flesh comes together, and as far as God is concerned, a divorce is when flesh separates itself from flesh, whether you've got a piece of paper or not. That's a spiritual divorce, according to the Word of God. I wonder tonight, if Jesus were to come, how many of us, sitting in this room right now, could honestly say to Him, Lord Jesus, I've been a, I'm a chaste virgin. I love you more than anybody else. I serve you more than anybody, than I do anything else. You are number one in my life. Nothing is more important than you in my life. Now that's a chaste virgin spiritually. Or will he find when he comes, you and I, in spiritual fornication, more involved in the pleasures of life, and the more involved, uh, you know, this separates the, this is, these kinds of messages are church splitters. You find those uh, that don't like this kind of stuff will start drifting off. Well, go ahead and drift. It's got to be told. And the thing is this, my friend, that when the Lord Jesus comes, He'll come at a moment that you wouldn't think He'd come. Be therefore also ready for it. Such now as you think not, the Son of Man, for instance, He could come tonight. Probably won't. But he could come. Couldn't he? He could come. Let me ask you a question. Is your house in order? What do you find a chaste virgin? Or is there something in your life that's more important than your love for the Lord God himself? So, well, I really don't understand how, how you expect a uh, preacher, how you expect a man to love God. Uh, I don't expect you to a man to love God. I don't expect anything from you, my friend. I want you to understand that. I don't expect anything from you. Well, the Pat Dean, when he comes up here and leads music on Sunday mornings, he doesn't expect anything from you for singing. He is giving you an opportunity and giving me an opportunity to, to sing praises to God. But ladies say, 
Well, you know, sometimes I don't think that your worship, I, that your song service has put me in a mood for worshiping. You know, I, I think you folks, you just don't get moving fast enough. And I said, uh, well, where'd you ever get this idea that music was supposed to put you in, in a mood for worshiping God? I said, don't you know what my Bible says? From the Old Testament through the New Testament, when they sang, they sang praises because of something that was in their heart. I mean, how can I sing? Well, what am I, what are you supposed to do? Be a cheerleader up here to get you to sing, oh, how I love Jesus? This is not a basketball game. This is God's people sitting here who's redeemed, uh, who have been saved, who love God, and they're supposed to sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And sing it like you mean it. And get some joy. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, and you know, you're, you're, you're saying you're being very crude. Uh, you don't know. Uh, you ought to get up there in Brother Pat Dean's position sometimes and watch what people are doing. Picking their teeth and Everything else in the whole wide world. Come on, dear people. This is Almighty God up there. He's redeemed us and saved us, and he's and he's getting excited because he says uh, over here in the in verse uh, seven, "Let us be glad and rejoice. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. It's come. Here it is. The thing that we've been waiting for all this time. Getting so." Excited about. Hmm. There goes the new Mercedes. What am I going to do with my big boat? Oh boy, I just got my finances in order. Don't get your finances in order, folks. Get your finances invested. <laughs> Don't get your life in order. Get your life invested. Don't get your children in order. Get your children invested. 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 Get them invested. Alright, so now we're going to, we're going to go ahead with this thing. Now not, not everybody gets invited to the wedding. We're going to deal with that a little bit, uh, well quite a bit, I hope so. Uh, not everybody gets invited. You see there's an engagement, as I started to say in second grade. So there's an engagement, that's why we get engaged first. See, and, th and then there's a marriage <laughs> up in heaven. Jesus is engaged. He's a spouse to one wife. To one husband, excuse me. And then there's going to be a marriage. And then what happens next? Reception. Big reception. Big. You don't go to reception unless you're invited to the reception. We're going to study this, this evening about some guy to try to sneak into the reception. And we'll see what happened to him. But who was he? Did he lose his salvation? <laughs> I mean, he was in there. And he got tossed out. What did he do? Lose his salvation? <laughs> well, I don't know who he was, but I can't lose mine. Well, if I can't lose it, then it must be somebody else. Yeah, that's what we need to find out. Somebody got in there. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. The bride doesn't have to be invited. She's taken out of the side of the bridegroom. Bridegroom doesn't have to be invited. That's as I told you before. That's one wedding where all eyes will not be on the bride. All eyes will be on the bridegroom. You got to sec take second place up there, hon. Here comes the bride. The music starts to play. Oh, here comes the bride. Whatever it is, you know. And uh, you know how that song goes. And down she comes. She's ugly as a mud fence, but they put a veil over her face and you think she was a... You know, and the guy stands there as proud as punch, boy. He just... He is the bridegroom. He's standing there like this. He thinks he's getting something. He sure is. <laughs> how was it said? Somebody said marriage is like a midnight phone call. You get a ring and then you wake up. <laughs> Or something like that. But anyhow, uh, and then after that's all over, there's this reception, there's this wedding feast. And then there's a, a honeymoon, isn't there? And that honeymoon is a thousand years long. 
where the moon shines seven times brighter. That's the honey of a moon. Everyone is not invited. Everyone doesn't come to the reception after the wedding. Everybody doesn't come to the wedding. Got you spoiled, doesn't he? Now, I think we did last uh, week, did we not? A week before last, uh, we took you to John chapter 3, verse 29. Did we not? John chapter 3, verse 29, where John the Baptist... John the Baptist is not the bride. John chapter 3, verse 29. Uh, some of our friends just came in with us. Let's move that to over there very quickly. I don't want to take you all that we've been through. But let's just read that very quickly so that we know where we are because we need to get this thing. Look at verse 28. But ye yourselves, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. Look at verse 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. John the Baptist isn't in the wedding. He's just a friend. Notice. Notice something. The best man is the bridegroom. And I told you that and you wouldn't believe me. You have to ask my wife. I didn't know too much. In fact, I didn't know very little about the Bible. But when they said, you're going to have a best man, I said, he's here. And said, you bet your boots it was me. If I ain't the best man... Uh, and there's a best man around there somewhere. Why doesn't she marry him? I'm the best man. Guy says, well, you got to have witnesses. I said, okay, we'll get two witnesses. I got my brother and, and my wife's sister, my wife's older sister. And I said, sit down in the front row there. And when he wants you to say, say something. But you just, uh, you know, you're just hanging around as friends. I'm the best man. You say, you're an egotist. You got it right. You know why I know I was the best man? Because she told me I was. And even though she has to emphasize it at times with a broom and a frying pan, she keeps reminding me that I am the best man. So John the Baptist is not part of the bride. Oh, my dear friend, don't you see right off the bat you got some problems. you got some folks that are coming to the wedding that aren't part of the wedding party. Has anybody ever studied that? Does anybody understand that? Does anybody care about that? So well, I don't care any difference. I'm going to be, I'm going to be the bride. Are you sure? There are guests that are invited, invited to this wedding. Now notice I said guests that are invited to this wedding. There are people who were saved by grace between the time of Adam on the law. Would you agree with me on that? They were saved by grace. There was no law. And then there's some people that got saved from the law until crucifixion. That's John the Baptist. That's the second group of people. And then there's some people that got saved in this dispensation like you and I. Play. That's the bride. Amen? And then there's some people that are going to get saved in the tribulation. They're called tribulation saints. And they're going to be at the wedding. But then there's some folks. You see, the wedding comes over, and then we come down to this earth, and there's a thousand year reign on this earth, but then there's some folks that get saved in the millennium. They're not in the wedding party. They're not at the wedding. They're not at the wedding party, nor are they at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, they get saved afterwards. Has anybody ever taken any time to consider that? <laughs> so I don't think that that's essential. <laughs> You're going to be out there. You better make sure that you know where you're going to be. And I want you to notice something else over here that, that all they listen to is the bridegroom's voice. He's the center of the attention. The Lord Jesus Christ. And nobody, but nobody, and everybody, but everybody put together will not be able to take away from the glory of the Lamb of God, the bridegroom. That's going to be some wedding. Now, uh, for two weeks, or week, week before last, we got started a week before last, and 
maybe this is the last week, uh, last week maybe a little bit, we talked about the wife getting ready for this wedding. And the best that you can do, you're not going to get completely ready. Well, you say, now, now preacher, just, just one second over here. Uh, you can't tell me, uh, well, all right, I'm not going to tell you anything. Uh, turn me to, uh, oh, turn me to Ephesians chapter 5, and let's do some scripture verses here until we find out uh, this family of God and find out all the individuals that are found in the family of God. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, verse 26, verse 25, well, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so ought men to love their wives, he goes on explaining it. So he wants, there's no question about this thing. The Lord is, says he wants his bride to be spotless. He wants his bride to be absolutely spotless, wrinkle-proof or any such thing. Uh, turn with me to, uh, uh, you won't turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 because I think we spent some time on that last week, did we not? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, while we described the judgment seat of Christ uh, to a point, saying that the materials that you use are to be the materials like the foundation, and the foundation is Jesus Christ. I wish, I wish we could understand that, folks. I wish you could understand that the material you sent up there can't be second grade stuff. It can't be third grade stuff. It can't be just some old two by fours or, or an old piece of this or piece of that, my dear friend. The stuff that you sent up there must be comparable to the foundation. And the foundation is Jesus Christ. I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something, honestly. What have you sent and what have I sent up there since we've been saved that is comparable to Christ? Well, there's only one thing that you can send up there that will be comparable to Christ, and that is a heart attitude. A heart that loves God. David was the, David was the bad apple. Yet he was the apple of God's eye. David murdered, David raped, David stole. David committed, well, I mean, you name me. David died with a horrible venereal disease, but yet the Bible says that he was the apple of God's eye. Why? Because his heart was always right. He was always ready, even if he make a mistake, he was already always ready and willing, and he'd pay the consequences. He said, well, what consequences did he pay? Well, man, he lost four children. One daughter was raped by, by one of his own sons, by one of her own brothers. Another son uh, got hung by his hair and they threw darts at him and killed him. Another, bro uh, another brother, uh, the brothers got together and killed him. He ended up losing the, a precious baby. He murdered a man. I mean, listen, folks, and he died. He died in a condition and I... I'm not going to pursue this. You'll have to read it for yourself. He died in a condition where they could take the first woman in the land and bring her near him and it didn't even raise any temperature in him. Totally, completely paid the price of sin. As 6,000 people in this world every 24 hours are paying the price of sin. Well, the latest statistics out, according to your newspaper, that the latest statistics out that are every 24 hours, there are 6,000 new cases of AIDS in the world today. I was watching something a couple of days ago. I forget when it was. Uh, just before supper, one of those idiots, I, I can't stand those talk shows. I just can't stand them. I like to put them all in boiling oil. And every time they stick their head up, shove it back down in. I, the, 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 the people that they cause more trouble in America, they're always stirring something, some stup stupid thing up. But this was a good program. This was of some young people. I, I saw one of, the, one, of the, one of the prettiest young ladies that I've seen with a long skirt down her ankles. Prettiest young ladies, a senior in high school. 
Maybe you saw the program. And she's sitting there. And they began to talk to her. There were five or six of them, but this one, the one they focused on. She'll be graduating this June. She's got a year and a half to live. She said, I've only been promiscuous twice in my life. But the second time I was promiscuous, the man I was promiscuous with gave me AIDS. She said, I knew there was something wrong and I went to be tested. And they told me I have AIDS. Probably got a year and a half to two years to live. The man said to her, he said, uh, has this changed your life? I mean, do you have, does this shock you? What's on so and so? She says, I want you to know that I have, as a senior, the most pathetic testimony I've ever heard in my life. I told you young people this. I guess this was last week. Most pathetic thing I've ever heard in my life. She said, no. She said, I, I've accepted it. I know I've got a year and a half to two years to live. I know I'm going to die and I'm going to die a horrible death. But she said, I take one day at a time. I've been living it to the fullest. My time is limited. And he said, he said, the, the interviewer said, my, that's remarkable and marvelous. He was going to say something. But she says, but, but, and he stopped. And then she said this, I'm 17 and a half years old. And all of my dreams of graduating from high school and going to college and getting married and having children and having grandchildren have had to be wiped out of my imagination. And I'm living as a person who would love to be married and have children, but I know that I never will. I mean, that interviewer just got frustrated. He didn't know what to say. Just it floored him. The whole audience just went, ooh, like this. As that young lady gave that testimony. Who knows what any of us will have to go through before we meet the Lord. But you know what? The Bible says of what sort it is. Is your heart right? Is your heart ready? Are you prepared? As he says in Revelation chapter 19, are you prepared? Are you getting prepared? Are you getting prepared for that day when you stand before the bridegroom? Come on now. That doesn't mean you become a holy Joel, start waving your Bible, run around and jump. But let's start evaluating some things. Well, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That ye through his what? Poverty might become what? We old people. We, but we're living like God's dead. Like he doesn't care. He says, get ready. Turn me to Romans chapter 14. Let's jump up. Now let's turn to 2 Corinthians. You're to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Turn to that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, let's look at verse 9. I think that's what I want. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of Him. For we must all we must all. He's talking to Christians. For we must all. We must all. Every one of us who claims to be saved and claims to be born again. Every one of us. You say, well, I, 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 preacher, does that include Methodists and Episcopalians and Pentecostals? No, 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 no. You don't understand this thing. This includes not Methodists and Pentecostals and Baptists and Lutherans. This includes the, the bride of Christ. Let's get off of denominational, denominationalism for a while. And let's look at this thing. He's not talking about denominationalism. He's talking about every born-again Christian. He's not talking about John the Baptist. He's not talking about Adam and his descendants up to the time of law. He's not talking about the tribulation saints. He's talking about you. He said, brothers, you people, you and I, all who have been saved by grace, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror, terror, T-E-R-R-O-R, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade man that we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also made manifest in your consciences. 
that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You know what he's saying simply and clearly? He is just corroborating what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Why did you do what you did? Why are you here tonight? Why do you attend church? Why do you witness? Why do you read your Bible? Why, my friend, my dear friend, well, I, I witness because I want to win men and women to Christ. That's not the right attitude. That's not the real reason why you ought to be reading your Bible or going to church. You ought to be going to church and reading your Bible and singing and giving and because you love Him. And only because you love Him. Everything else will come. Everything else will fall into place. You won't have to worry about living right. You won't have to worry about singing right. You won't have to worry about listening right. You won't have to worry about walking right. You won't have to worry about talking right. If you love Him! I know you. Teachers are supposed to be different, but this is the way I teach. That's the only way I know how to teach. Uh, turn with me to what I marked down here. I'll show you some things here if we can. Turn me to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Look at that thing there. Supposed to get ready. What do you think this thing is going to, listen folks, do you know how long, do you know how long a bride starts to get ready for a wedding? <laughs> I mean, you don't walk here 10 minutes before the wedding. I mean, 10 minutes before a wedding and, and you come along and, uh, uh, you say, uh, 10 minutes before and say, well, I think I'll go downtown and buy a gown. Oh, we got four minutes before the wedding and we better order some flowers. Huh? Come on. Let's face it. That's about the way it'd have been with me. If I'd have had my way, I'd just have eloped. I just think that that's the best way to do it. It's more fun that way. It feels like you're doing something wrong. Now, I'm just kidding, folks. I'm just kidding now. Come on. Romans chapter 14. Look at verse, uh, oh, look at verse uh, 10. 14, verse 10. This Bible's full of it. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You know what he's saying there? Get your nose out of your brother's business. Quit judging him. Let Christ judge him. Let Christ judge him. Paul said to me, he says, well, he says, you know, the church has got to be careful. Not too long ago, he says, the church has got to be careful because if you're not careful, the church can sure slip into heresy. I says, you're right, brother. You're right, brother. I guess you're right. I said, explain something to me. I'm not too smart. Would you explain to me what is heresy? Took off his shoes and put a little absorbing junior on his athlete's foot and tied his shoes back up and fixed his tie and scratched his head and hair and gave me some stupid answer and I says, Go ahead, go ahead, take a walk. Have no idea. People telling you, well, the church is going to go into heresy, and they have no idea what heresy is. Said, you think there's any heresy in this church? I hope so. What? Said, you think there's any heresy in this church here? I said, I hope so. I hope there's some heresy in this church. Chapter 14, verse 10 of Romans, verse 11, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one of us, now he's talking to Christians, he said us, for every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. To God. Turn me to First Corinthians chapter 11. Some of you are still in shock. As I said, I hope there is. I saw one or two nodding their heads. When I said, I hope there is. First Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 19. All oh, no, verse 18. But first of all, when you come together in the church, I, I hear that there be divisions among you. <laughs> Must have been a Baptist church. First Corinthians chapter nine, uh, 11. Verse 18. First of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. Verse 19. For there must be also heresies among you. There must be. Why? That they which are approved may be made manifest among you. But you know what happens? God's people will 
will say, I wonder if that heretic is right. And they start taking the side of the heretic. Instead of understanding the Bible says there's got to be heresy, so you can have a comparison to see who, who really is right. You can tell who God's people are. Well, how can you tell a man saved? Well, he lives different than the unsaved world. You've got a comparison. Everything is a comparison. Look at You want to know what is handsome, what is ugly? J.R. and myself. Take a look. Beg pardon? I should have known better than to give you a break for coffee because some of you got some things that... All right. Uh, Revelation chapter 19. Now we're, we're, okay. Now you understand that working out your own salvation... Is there anybody that doesn't understand that? That doesn't mean you work for your salvation. That's the reason that you have to have works for your salvation. That means that now you can begin to do some work because you have salvation in you. Turn me to Ephesians chapter 2. We might as well uh, stay with that whole thing, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. And we, I'll tell you what, if we ever get out of Revelation chapter 19 for June, I don't know. We haven't touched that. I'm going to have to get the family of God and, and we've got the, we got a war in heaven to talk about and, uh, uh, we've got uh, war on this earth to talk about, and we've got married supper to talk about, and we've got brothers and sisters in Christ. We've got so much here in Revelation chapter 19. What did I say? Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace are you saved through... Verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Not of works. See that verse? Not of works, lest any man should boast. Watch this. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Work out your own salvation. Unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You don't do a cotton-picking thing, as they say down south. You don't say a blooming thing, as they say out in Montana. And what do we say over here? Huh? Can't say... Can't say it from the pulpit here. All right, yeah. <laughs> you cannot do anything to get salvation. There isn't a thing that you can do. There isn't a thing that you can add to it. There isn't a thing that you can subtract from it. But once you get that on the inside, now you can do something with it. By the grace of God. By the grace of God. I remember this, that no matter what you do, don't ever forget it. What you do, where you do it, or how you do it, God does not see it. He sees it in Christ and His righteousness. It is all the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all Him. And uh, so when He says over here, uh, verse 10, there we are, His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Don't lose the sight of that, that once God puts covers you with his righteousness, then you now can begin to function intelligently. And you don't function in the sense of start to figure out what you're going to do. You function from loving him. And if you love him, then everything else falls into line. All right, now what are we going to do here? All right, let's go back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 19, I'll go about five minutes and then we'll, we'll have to quit there because it's, uh, time is getting by. Okay, let's go to verse 9, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Verse 8 says, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed, to her was granted, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. So it isn't anything that she did in that sense of as far as salvation is concerned. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Fine linen is righteousness of saints. Uh, if you want to have some a good time sometime, uh, trace what linen was in the Old Testament and see what the Jew was permitted to do or do not do as far as linen was concerned. And then here we find it, linen here in the New Testament. That's interesting. But then we'll let go of that. Okay. And he saith unto me, verse 9, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper 
of the Lamb, and he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And then he goes and worships him. All right. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is this, that now there are people who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay. Uh, the wedding takes place And there are those who are there. But the wedding, the wedding supper, people are called to it. Now, I'm not going to pursue that any farther because we don't have the time for it. But this is going to help you when you study Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 23, maybe not so much Matthew chapter 23, as Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25. Now, when you understand that they were called to it, and some got in and some didn't, then you're going to understand about the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins. And the five foolish virgins, or the five wise virgins who had oil, <coughs> they weren't waiting to, they weren't, listen, they were not waiting to get to heaven, they were waiting for the bridegroom. And they were not the bride, they were virgins. Virgins are the Old Testament saints, starting with 144,000. And the five foolish virgins went out to buy oil, type of the Holy Spirit. You don't buy the Holy Spirit in this dispensation, this day and age. You get this thing straight about being called. Now you're going to get Matthew 22, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. When we get to that thing, you're going to find out why that guy got thrown out. You're going to find out why when he said, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name and that in your name? And he said, depart me, I never knew you. It's got to be a wedding garment that you've got to have on. Not talking about you and me now. We're, folks, we're the bride. We're the bride, man. You, We're the bride. He's the bridegroom. Well, what kind of wedding would it be without having guests and friends and so on and so forth there? I could make some analogies, but I won't, you know. <laughs> you get thinking about some of that stuff, you know. Get thinking about some of those things. Thank God the devil won't be able to get in. You know there is going to be a war in heaven. And devil and his cohorts are cast out of heaven. Why? <laughs> God doesn't hang out his dirty linen before the enemy. The woodshed is going to be the judgment seat of Christ when everything is revealed. But the enemy's not going to hear it. Because the old devil would just be up to, huh? Oh yeah, you know that guy. Yeah, you know that guy, Bobby. Oh, you know J.R. Oh boy. And that guy, Sabaka. Oh boy. Woo wee. I mean, listen, boy. And he'd be laying all in and God says, shut up. Come on, take a walk. Take a hike. We'll take care of our own family problems. And then the family gets up there. And daddy takes care of things. And the children weep. Weep, weep, because there's nobody like him. You see him, nobody like him. I can't describe it to you, I can't understand it completely. When you see him, not only are you going to be able to see him with your eyes, but you're going to feel him with your very soul. Does that? No, it's, there's, a, there's, there, there's just no way to describe that, 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 that feeling can describe it, but it's have to be careful how you say things. Some folks are a little more sensitive than others, and I don't blame you for that. So we have blessed are they which are called, which are called, which are called. Uh, we have putting all this material together so we can get started. And and by the way, by the way, before we go any farther, let me just uh, drop your uh, attention to. Uh, let's drop your attention to 1 John chapter 2. Turn back here for just a minute. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I had a businessman one time tell me, he said, one of the things that we do here in this place is we say, when we trying to get, he, he was selling, um, what do you call these franchises? And he says, before we sell that franchise, we go through the whole thing. And then, and then we say, what is there about our company that you should invest your money? Is there something about our company 
that you feel that you ought not to invest your money. He's pretty smart. And he wanted to put something into our missions program. And uh, this statement that I made was worth $190,000 in missions. He said to me, he says, what is there about the missions program of Bible Baptist Church in Staten Island? What is there about that thing that I should invest my money? Standing there, a little short Jewish fellow. And I said, turn with me to 1 John chapter, just like that God gave it to me. Turn me to 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, Now little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him and his coming. And he wrote me a check out for $50,000 without blinking an eye. Why? She might not be ashamed. He's kind of, now I wasn't putting the pressure on him. He's the man who called me up and said, I want you to come out and see me. He said, I have made, uh, what was it? Uh, I don't know. He, just, he was a multimillionaire. He made so much money, he didn't know what to do with it. He was going to have to give it all to Uncle Sam and he wanted to give it away. And he asked me to come out and that's what I did. I read that to him. I don't think he ever got over it. Well, I, maybe, maybe I shouldn't say he ever got over it. I think he did get over it eventually, but, uh, <laughs> Look at uh, 1 John chapter 3. While well, we're in 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. Look at uh, verse uh, uh, 1, uh, 2, 3. I'm hoping that's what I have. 1, 2, 3, and 4. Let's read it anyhow. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. But, now watch that thing. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. With that, we're going to close because it's time to well, this is the con this is of course the context is the rapture. Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also a, a trans <laughs> whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law, and so on and so forth. This is of course the picture of the rapture. We shall see him as he is. May I leave that leave you with that? We have the families of God. I think we can go very quickly with the families of God next week. Very quickly, just giving you the scriptures where the families of God are found. We'll be studying in the book of Zechariah. We'll be studying in the book of Song of Solomon. Uh, the rapture is found in the sec uh, second chapter of Song of Solomon. The second coming of Jesus Christ is found in the third chapter of Song of Solomon. The family of God is found in the sixth chapter of the Song of Solomon. I am the 45th Psalm. I'm the 45th Psalm. You have the family of God. It consists of Old Testament saints who were saved before the law, from Adam up to uh, Moses. They were saved by grace. Nothing else to do. From Moses on, was dispensation of law. Salvation was of grace. But there were some things that they had to do. They had to kill a lamb. There were some ceremonial rituals that they had to follow. And it was not to get them saved, but pointing to the day that the Lamb of God would come. Every pro, every ritual, everything that they went through, the children of Israel went through, everything, every piece of furniture in the tabernacle, every piece of furniture in the, uh, every piece of wood and every piece of gold, uh, in the, in the, in the ark, pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the wood, which was a type of His humanity, was covered with gold, which is the type of His, uh, deity, which is the, uh, the Son of God, the God-Man, all God and all man, everything pointed. So the Jew, uh, the Israelite did not get saved by keeping those, by doing, he was saved by the grace of God, by faith in what God was going to do. And he demonstrated that faith by sacrificing the Lamb, looking for the day that the Lamb of God would be slain. You and I, and then after the Lamb of God was slain, and was buried and rose again, you and I are saved by grace, but we demonstrate our works 
from the fact that Christ lives within us now. Manifesting that there is a resurrected Christ. They were manifesting that there was a Christ that was going to die. We manifest that there is a Christ who did die, who was buried, who arose again, and is coming again. And there will be the tribulation saints, of course, to those people after the church is gone, after she's raptured up, where the Spirit of God goes with those of us who live with Him. God will still work in His Spirit upon the earth, but He will not come to dwell within a man as He did in this dispensation of grace that doesn't make God any less or any better. It's just the way that God works in a particular dispensation. That is the dispensation of the tribulation working to make Israel understand that He is their Messiah because Israel will rule the world. You may not like them, but the Jew will rule the world. You and I are the bride of Christ. And then after Christ comes and defeats the nations and so on and so forth, then Jesus Christ will set up a millennial reign and there will people be saved who will be called the millennial saints. They will be saved. They won't have to have faith because they'll see him. As you well know that during the tribulation, the land mass will go back to revert to back where it was in Revelation, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 6. If you'd like to sometime, go downstairs to the high school department and take a look at the world map we have there. And all you'd have to do is shove all the continents together. They fit almost perfectly. Almost perfectly. When all the land mass is pushed back together and the water's put in all of its place, there'll be no problems for men to travel to Jerusalem and back where the king will be sitting during the millennial reign without any excuse. Without any excuse. Without any excuse. Let's take a vacation today, Mom says. Okay, where are we going? Let's go to Jerusalem and see Jesus. I going to be someday on the millennial reign. Whether or not uh, you and I will ever get, I'll ever get to the place where I'll be able to discuss with you as to what you'll be doing in the millennium, uh, that's pretty heavy, but we can do it. But remember this, what I will be telling you something is just my personal opinion. But I believe that I can tell you what you will be doing in eternity according to the Word of God and why you'll be able to do it and uh, so on and so forth. It's a great big old universe out there. And God's getting it ready. He's getting it ready when the new heavens and the new earth come into being. Brother Sabaka, that's some of the finest preaching I have ever heard. <laughs>